Hello and welcome to the SRA Podcast. This is Faye. And this is Austin. And our very special guest, Parison Bolt. Welcome on. Hey y'all, what's up? Awesome. So we're not going to do our sort of traditional interview structure today. Instead, I think we're just going to jump straight into discussing the news and what's been going on lately. So biggest item in the news lately is basically women have no control over their bodies in half the country now. Yeah, it's been super disheartening to see what the Supreme Court is capable of by challenging Roe versus Wade like this. You know, all the states kind of laying the groundwork to transform our country back into a theocracy as much as they can. Yeah, I heard in Alabama they've pushed it all the way so that it's like a total ban. It's not even a six-week ban or, or something like that, like some of these other states have foisted upon folks, but it's an entire ban, which is pretty damning. And it's been, I think the record now is at like eight different states that now have passed bills that limit the procedure. So we're... Again, slipping more and more into hell with every day that goes by. Yeah, that's for sure. I was I was amazed by like the suddenness of it. It's like this wasn't on my radar at all. And then suddenly four or five states all passed these bills at the same time. You know, Alabama, Missouri, I think was it, um, did Georgia pass one? Mm-hmm. Yep, they sure did. Ohio also. So it, it's uh, Ohio, Utah, Arkansas, Missouri, Mississippi, Kentucky, Georgia, and Alabama. So one thing that I think I want to make clear right now is this is something that's been bothering me and a lot of the liberal reaction to this is to people to just say, oh, well, that makes sense because Alabama is just trash or, oh, Kentucky, it's just uh, it's just a garbage state full of garbage people. It's important to realize that polling shows that even in these states that are very conservative that pass these bills, the majority of the state's residents oppose this level of restriction on abortion. These bills do not necessarily reflect the majority opinion of the people who live in Alabama and Mississippi. These reflect the views of the sort of Christian theocrats who control their government. Right. You can kind of see the like extremely uh, classist response play out. Like people are just ready to dismiss just huge swaths of the country because they just see them as from a lower class. And, you know, like, oh, we don't really need to like think about their opinions. They're ready to throw away the entire state for what the conservative leadership does. And it's really fucked. It's just classism all over again. It reeks of the sort of coastal liberal elitism. Absolutely. I think it's also worth noting, too, like Faye mentioned, that it's a incredibly cohesive vision of banning abortion. I mean, it seems like this has been incredibly coordinated. And the big fear after Kavanaugh was appointed to the Supreme Court was that something like this would happen. And experts have been saying that the entire reason why these bills are being foisted forward is because of the fact that they can kind of generate a uh, controversy or a potential Um, opportunity for people to reconsider or rethink Roe v. Wade in the Supreme Court. And I would not be surprised if we start marching slowly but steadily towards something like that in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. There have been so many articles written about this. There was one like in the Washington Post that I was checking out the other day because a lot of conservative people who are pushing things like this, they know that the Supreme Court is likely to gradually change some of these things as opposed to immediately overturn Roe vs. Wade, but they're totally fine with that. They're fine with taking these drastic measures so that, like, gradually slip into <laughs> slip into into hell, as you said. Right, it's like the erosion principle, right? And not everything all at once, but rather this slow sort of decay, um, this steady march of repealing these rights that women have to their bodies. It's definitely... Definitely discouraging and indicative of the sort of theocratic Christian fundamentalist current that exists in the United States that, again, is not a majority, but is rather a minority. But it is, in fact, a minority that possesses a lot of capital and a lot of power. And I think that that's one of the reasons why we're seeing this sort of thing happen in such frequency and with such intensity and coordination. Right. It's emblematic of how undemocratic our system is, how little say citizens even within states have in their own legislation. It's a good example to point to. Agreed. (laughs) So these laws have passed. So what can we do to fight it? Obviously, there's going to be battles in the courts, but that's not something that ordinary people can take part in. So 
what can we as ordinary working class people do to help women who need abortions and may not have access to them? So there are various funds being set up to provide people with money to get abortions or to get them to a state where abortion is legal so that they can do what they need to do to not be saddled with a burden for the rest of their lives that they aren't prepared to deal with. So I'm aware of the Yellow Hammer Fund in Alabama, and I believe there's another fund in Mississippi. So those are good places to donate to. You can do some research, make sure that it's a legitimate thing and not just some sketchy GoFundMe. But in addition to that, I think it's really important that people organize on the ground to help out people in their community. I think that, for instance, uh, having escorts at abortion clinics in the states where those still exist is incredibly important and we need more people to do to show up and put a barrier between women in a you know the most vulnerable position of their lives potentially to put a barrier between them and the hateful anti-choice mobs that show up outside these clinics yeah this kind of touches on something that we've covered before that like if you are in a position of privilege and you want to actually help those people Sometimes it helps to literally physically be in the way, like literally body block people from being intercepted or harassed or whatever, you know, like it it really does help to be in the right place at the right time to protect people who are vulnerable, regardless of the situation. You know, if it's a woman outside an abortion clinic, uh, you know, a person of color being pulled over by a police officer, you know. Obviously, don't go crazy with it. The revolution isn't going to start with one person, but, you know. (laughs) No, for Uh. sure. I think there's also a lot of good work that Planned Parenthood does. I know that Planned Parenthood is, you know, more of a liberal institution, and some people on the left might pew-pew that, but I know that they do a lot of that work, uh, Austin, that you're talking about, of sort of getting in the way of, you know, being escorts, being security for folks who are trying to get abortions. Um, So I think that that kind of work is really, really vital and is a really physical manifestation of what solidarity and mutual aid looks like. Putting yourself and interposing yourself between somebody who is making a healthcare choice for their their self with their body and the rabid fundamentalist hordes that uh, are chomping at the bit to tear them down or ridicule them or harass them is, I think, a really meaningful gesture that speaks volumes to um, the type of world that we want to live in, one that's rooted in brotherhood and solidarity and in fraternity and not rooted in hatred and reactionary ideological claims to uh, what constitutes a human life. Right, exactly. Something that I wanted to bring up i wanted to at least mention that like these people have phone numbers a lot of these representatives like can be contacted i'm not gonna tell anyone to go do death threats or anything like that but just to voice dissent when you force them to to hear it it's sort of like that saying with regards to global warming that the people destroying our planet are people with names and addresses and Sometimes direct protest actions outside someone's home can have a significant impact, but calling a representative, especially if you aren't a resident of that state, has a very limited impact. And these people know that their policies are unpopular in their states. They know that this is harming a bunch of people and those people won't vote for them. But those people already don't vote or can't vote or the uh, politician just has so much entrenched power that they can just power through and they don't have to worry about what their constituents say. I've run into that in my own local organizing where we have very conservative people in our local government and you can go protest and call their phone and annoy them all you want, but at the end of the day, they have a district full of conservative white people who will vote for them over and over and over again. And that's sort of what you run into in states like Alabama, Missouri, Ohio, where you have these gerrymandered states where these representatives have locked in constituencies that will elect them over and over again. And it doesn't really matter what poor people say or do or what liberal people say or do, because there's no way to harm them. And any sort of actual physical threat would only harm our own causes. So it's sort of a situation where these people are responsible and they do have names and addresses and phone numbers, but it's really limited in what we can do against them without harming our own cause. Hell yeah. Well, you guys want to talk about Venezuela? Yeah, 
yeah let's talk about venezuela yeah let, let's let's solve venezuela real quick let's <laughs> let's just let's just take a sec let's just unpack venezuela just you know just hash it out right here right now i mean obviously three white people in america are the ideal people to solve the venezuela issue <laughs> <laughs> yeah so on the venezuela front it looks like guaido's coup has mostly fizzled out it's i think attempts are still ongoing but the army hasn't come to his side the supreme court justice that the cia bribed has not come to his side all the sort of propaganda efforts have not really resulted in a mass movement to oust maduro we just get this sort of ongoing discontent in that country but what has happened, the Venezuelan embassy in Washington, D.C. has been occupied for the past several weeks by members of the Answer Coalition, which is a sort of anti-war group, which is affiliated with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. So that sort of Marxist-Leninist sort of uh, slant to things. And they've been occupying the embassy with the permission of the Venezuelan ambassador of the Maduro administration. The ambassador gave them the keys, they went in, they answered. Answer occupied that building and have been preventing um, Waido's officials from occupying it. And so there's been sort of confrontations and clashes around that, but that finally ended today when U.S. officials broke international law to evict the embassy occupiers and hand over the keys to the still largely unrecognized government of Waido. Hey, you know, why the fuck not? U.S. government is going to do whatever the U.S. government is going to do, and... Uh they're used to just getting away with stuff like this so yikes didn't um guaido or in maduro or at least representatives of guaido and maduro meet in norway this weekend i had not heard that so i'm looking at i'm looking at al jazeera right now who knows if it'll actually pan out doesn't sound especially positive but better than nothing there's a lot of rhetoric in here about them like not getting along (laughs) which is like not surprising but like it doesn't sound like it's going to actually pan out into anything positive but at least they're talking with each other and not shooting each other anymore so i guess that's a positive development yeah i'm it definitely is i mean anything short of invasion at this point is uh is fairly positive yeah i mean it's pretty clear we've had people like john bolton and marco rubio and that other iran contra ghoul have all been pushing for a military intervention in venezuela and i think that's really the worst case scenario and these talks i don't think will come to anything because i don't think there's any agreement that they could come to that would satisfy the u.s security state but as long as they can prevent or delay a u.s intervention i think that's probably a good thing Yeah, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Speaking of John Bolton and other Iran-Contra favorites, there's also the shit that's been going down with Iran and sort of the escalating tensions in the Middle East that have been ramping up. I was wondering what your guys' thoughts on that were. I think John Bolton has replaced Viagra in his life with the deaths of civilians in the Middle East, so... I think that's pretty much what's going on here. I think it's pretty clear that John Bolton has been trying to start a war. Even the liberal media has been pointing this out. I remember there was an Onion article. John Bolton stumbles into the Capitol building bleeding, saying that he was shot by Iran. (laughs) Wow. A lot of people seem to have this idea, especially liberals, that the Trump White House is a single ideological front. That it is like a unified font of evil, which wants to serve russia or whatever nonsense and what we see here is really a division between john bolton who is a representative of the sort of neoconservative consensus of the george bush years versus trump for john bolton a war in iran is like the ultimate accomplishment of everything that he's ever wanted whereas for trump getting into a war it would be a violation of his campaign promises and while we might joke that campaign promises especially from trump who is a huge liar don't matter Something like getting into a major war, especially with a country like Iran, which would not be an easy fight. It's not going to be like Desert Storm in Iraq, where their military is defeated in three days. Fighting Iran would be a major conflict on the scale of Vietnam or, you know, the fight against ISIS. It would be a major military conflict. And so sort of restarting that foreign policy and getting into a major war would actually be a major political blow for Trump. 
So Trump has been fighting back against Bolton within his administration. And there's even been talk that Bolton could be fired if he continues pushing for a conflict. But I think it also sort of shows that officials within the uh, White House can pursue their own agenda separate from what the president wants. Bolton can direct his, his aides and his employees and his allies in the administration to make statements that hype up the conflict with Iran. He spun a routine deployment of ships, which was something that had been planned for months. He spun that as a deliberate increase in force to counter Iran. He talked up the uh, intelligence hearings that there may be a terrorist attack. They, they talked up the terror sabotage attack on a couple of ships, which I think is pretty sketchy. I'm not, as far as I can tell, the attack didn't accomplish anything. You know, that sort of reminds me of like, um, oh, what was that ship? The USS Spain? Exactly. Like, I was just about to say, like, mm, that has a precedent of uh, starting wars <laughs> in U.S. history, at least being like oh my god they attacked our ship can you believe it i guess we should probably level their whole country i definitely think it's also incredibly damning that the united states government has walked itself back into this exact same corner that it's been with iraq in the past um i think that it's incredibly unlikely that it'll escalate to war but i think that the possibility that it exists is still incredibly damning and the fact that the u.s media has fallen into sort of lockstep and is continuing to beat the war drums should be a a kind of a signal to all of us that are paying attention that we don't really have any allies in the corporate media and not that anyone who's probably listening to this podcast ever thought that we did but that (laughs) means that we have to really ramp up and make sure that independent media is like actually able to defend itself against these kinds of bad faith arguments from the corporate media that is not at all acting as a watchdog upon the ruling class or upon the US government but is instead simply following along and you know chanting for for endless war and you can see that sort of bias in the way that media talks about it you know You see this sort of bias between the way that Google will label Telesur as a media entity partially funded by the Venezuelan government, but then it refers to BBC as a public broadcasting service or as like a public television service. Exactly. We get this sort of inbuilt bias within the institutions that provide us with information to try to undermine certain sources of media and information and try to portray them as untrustworthy. Now, granted, I don't think that Telesur is a perfect media service and i think that they do engage in mistruth on occasion but then again so does bbc so does cnn so does npr all of these outlets lie from time to time to pursue their editorial objectives which are usually political certainly like the way that outlets like telesur or al jazeera are treated i think are ultimately rooted in very racist perceptions of other countries and a racist perception of other governments, which I think is extremely problematic. Yeah, there's there's definitely a bias towards Western media with how the internet is structured, you know, how search engines are structured, you know, to kind of passively endorse the words of media companies that are in warmongering countries. It's kind of crazy to see it play out. It was actually rather surprising to me that the media in this case did not back up John Bolton's attempt to stoke a war with Iran. The media has been pretty much 100% endorsing the coup in Venezuela since the day it started. I always go back to there's a Wall Street Journal article published in the very early days of the coup when they thought it was going to automatically succeed, where they basically laid out the entire plot and all of the people involved and just be like, oh yeah, Juan Guaido was chosen as a uh, potential leader by members of the uh, U.S. Embassy in Venezuela, you know, just straight up admitting to the coup. The media was 100% on board with overthrowing Maduro, but in the case of Iran, while initially they repeated the sort of State Department talking points as far as troop deployments and terror threats and the sabotage attack, while that was initially repeated credibly by the Western media, within a week or two that turned around and the media started calling out John Bolton by name and calling it out for what it was as an attempt to start a war. And I thought that was really interesting how the media got on board with one conflict but not on another. There is this alliance between the state and the Western media, but it doesn't always work out and in this case i don't think it did Mm -hmm. no i think that's an astute observation faith 
Yeah, I, I wonder if some of that doesn't have to do with uh, that Venezuela is a Latin American country and that it's a socialist government. And so there is kind of an inherent bias there. Like I remember all the time in school we were taught that socialism is, uh, is just as authoritarian as fascism and stuff like that. And it must be rooted out and gotten rid of because all it does is, is control its citizens and institute a dictatorship and et cetera, et cetera. I think that you can kind of see some of those biases and some of that blatant propaganda play out with how socialist com- countries are covered, not to mention the racism against Latin America. Yeah, no, I think that's also absolutely accurate. Um, I think that it's a systemic reflection of a much larger bias of white supremacy that exists in the West today. Absolutely. So I'm going to take a stance that will probably piss some people off, but... I think that we need to recognize that just because a country is unfairly targeted by Western media and by the state with the intent to destabilize a country and impose the United States will on it, doesn't mean that that country is automatically good. Like the government of Iran is not great. It's extremely autocratic, has strong theocratic elements to it. It's not as authoritarian or totalitarian or unitary as a lot of people like to portray it. But just because Iran is being, you know, targeted for attack by the U.S. doesn't mean that we need to support it uncritically. And likewise, just because the coup against Maduro is completely manufactured by the CIA and, you know, completely against the interests of the Venezuelan people, that doesn't mean that we need to uncritically support Maduro. It just means that we need to oppose war, to oppose intervention, to oppose this sort of constant meddling in their politics. But that doesn't mean that we need to endorse everything that Maduro has ever done. Agreed. I think that should be said more often on the left. Uh, Likewise with Assad in Syria or... Oh my fucking God. Oh my fucking God. Oh my God. Faye, don't even get me started on (laughs) Assad. Did you guys see the report that came out in the New York Times this uh, this past week? Um, Uh, Did not. So... Uh, a seven-year investigation has shown that over a hundred thousand political dissidents were disappeared under Assad, and they were locked into secret prisons, tortured, raped, mutilated, and yet you still find certain sectors of the left defending Assad and saying that he's actually somehow an anti-imperialist, and it makes me want to eat my shoe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that engaging with that same type of deity versus devil kind of mindset that is always fed to us by liberal media, by essentially by media in general. It's always a good guy versus a bad guy. I think engaging in that kind of stuff even in our in our discourse about US like interventionism and stuff like that. I don't think that it's doing anybody any favors. Because it's it's only lending credence to the conservative straw man that's thrown against socialism, that socialists will excuse any action as long as it's done by a socialist government. And it's only making that, that case seem more legitimate when we, we have to be critical. Because we if we are actually trying to establish successful socialism, then we have to learn from mistakes of the past. We can't just endorse everything that's ever been done by a socialist government. Yeah, agreed. Especially since Assad isn't even a fucking socialist. He's an authoritarian despot who is technocratic and horrifying. And right. It's just like the whole, the whole anti-imperialist line on the left gets way too out of hand. Obviously, it goes without saying, and I hope that no one misconstrues my my language here it goes without saying that anti-imperialism is a crucial part of the left but when your anti-imperialism becomes an excuse for war crimes just because you hate the u.s government your logic is flawed right you can still hate the u.s government and still be critical of u.s imperialism while also being critical of another state power that is employing torture and killing its own people like i don't understand Come on, guys. Let's right. use our brains. Let's think <laughs> the, critically here. It is, it is not a binary choice. Like, it is exactly. not one or the other. <laughs> the enemy of my enemy is not always my friend. Sometimes they're mm-hmm. still my enemy. <laughs> exactly. So it's, it's the sort of case that 
you know, you can make an argument that the U.S. should maybe not have been involved in the Syrian civil war, but that doesn't mean that we should be rooting for Assad to win the Syrian civil war. Exactly, especially when there's popular dissent from below. Oh my god, it makes me so fucking mad. Yeah, we need to actually respect the will of the people, and if the people are saying, fuck that guy, then we need to fucking listen. Yeah, and so it's the sort of situation that you need to be aware of who you're actually supporting. So I think that taking an anti-imperialist stance, taking an anti-war stance is extremely good, and we need to do that because I think particularly, as much as I'm critical about the anti-imperialist portion of the left stance on Syria or certain other states, I think that what they've done in Venezuela is very good. The Answer Coalition and PSL and Code Pink, these sort of Marxist-Leninist organizations that have you know stepped up and spread the idea that, hey, this media campaign against Venezuela is bullcrap. Hey, we shouldn't be invading Venezuela. We, this shouldn't even be on the table. The embassy occupiers who went in and protected that institution of representation of the Maduro government and protected that from being, for a time at least, from being taken over by the imperialist government of Juan Guaido, well, that's all very useful. I think that you have to sort of look at what is that same movement accomplished in terms of say Syria, giving critical support to Assad, I don't think has done anything to further the anti-imperialist cause. I wholeheartedly agree. And I think that the sort of stance that some people have taken against the YPG and against Rojava has been extremely damaging to international solidarity. Obviously, uh, Rojava and the YPG and the you know, Syrian Democratic Forces are not completely above criticism. And I do understand people's unease with the fact that they have worked with the U.S. government against ISIS. I understand why people are upset by that. But at the same time, when you look at the actual groups that are involved in Syria, the YPG is the is the uh, best option for obtaining some sort of power from below, for obtaining some sort of if not socialist system in Syria, at the very least a more democratic and less authoritarian system versus endorsing Assad and his, you know, complete autocratic takeover of the entire country. Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah, same. But solidarity with those groups for their actions to stop imperialism in Venezuela, though. Absolutely. 100%. So there's another topic that i sort of want to hit and i think it needs to be handled with a little bit of sensitivity but have you heard about sof the um new alt-right mascot on youtube no this is totally news to me what 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 is sof so sof is a 14 year old girl and she is a racist xenophobic slur using alt-right YouTuber who was recently profiled in BuzzFeed and has sort of been branded as the new spokesperson for the alt-right. So this is sort of a a situation where I think the liberal response to this has been very harmful. So first off, I just want to say that the way that you approach the topic of a racist 14-year-old spreading vile propaganda on YouTube, you have to take into mind that she is a 14 year old and this is a person who is still developing who is still developing their ideology and you know is likely being manipulated by the adults around her her scripts are co-written with an adult alt-right figure who is not named but i sort of want to draw some uh, criticism here to buzzfeed for what this article has actually accomplished so first off when pulling up the article the first thing you notice is that they pixelated Soph's face. I want to point out how asinine this is because they immediately provide a link to our actual YouTube channel where her face is uncensored. So that's... (laughs) That's airtight. That ship won't sink. Well done. So in this article, they make a few noises about how this is somewhat the fault of YouTube. They have one or two paragraphs where they mention YouTube's advertisers, but for the most part, the article focuses on Soph herself as a person and as a personality. And I think this has been very harmful, the publicity they've drawn to that, because since this article was published, Soph has gained over 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, just from the publicity of this article alone. And additionally, now Soph is defending herself from attacks from liberals and leftists who are sending her direct messages, leaving hateful comments on her YouTube and on her social media, 
When you attack someone for the views that they hold, you don't change those views. Instead, people become further entrenched in those ideas. Someone defending their ideology makes their ideology stronger. So with the publication of this article, I think that what BuzzFeed has actually done has actually solidified this child's adherence to hateful reactionary ideology. And I think that's a problem. <laughs> the, the way that we deal with these sorts of people and events the way that we criticize these needs to be done differently. Yeah, this is an an excellent example of the failures of of liberal media from many aspects of the political spectrum. Like, it's kind of funny to think about Fox News' coverage of AOC because a lot of people have said that they cover her and they put out her talking points and they, like, kind of advertise her so well that they're accidentally endorsing her a lot of the time. Like, a lot of people have kind (laughs) kind of noticed this. And I think that you can really point to that in the same way with how alt-right figures have been covered in in liberal media as well. Like, there was this tactic when Trump was saying horrifying things when he was trying to get elected of focusing on the things that he was saying and repeating them constantly and putting them in people's brains all the time and just relentlessly covering every single word that he said. And it had exactly the wrong effect putting those thoughts in people's heads and stuff is 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 not what you want what you want to do they're absolutely inept at debunking ideas at dissuading people from believing certain things all, all of that it's 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 the same failures over and over again and they just kind of refuse to learn from them yeah i uh i would need to look into this more before i voice an opinion on it but i've been listening to what you guys have been saying and reading this uh buzzfeed article intermittently and wow yeah it's 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 pretty fucked yeah it is it's very fucked that i'm just i'm like literally speechless at this this is un believable to me yeah there there are no depths anymore like it, it is a bottomless pit that i just don't that anyone how will is sink this, to how is this world real <laughs> <laughs> i will say for what it's worth youtube has removed the video that buzzfeed links they've removed that video for violating their policy on hate speech which is again this video was up for weeks before YouTube finally acted on it, and they only acted on it once it got publicity in the mainstream media and made YouTube look bad. So on one hand, you know, props to YouTube for removing hateful content, but they waited until it hit the media before they did so. The way that platforms like YouTube, like Twitter, like Facebook, the way that these companies deal with hate speech on their platforms is aberrant because it they basically give carte blanche to anyone to say any sort of hateful shit that they want until it affects their public image so like on twitter recently there's been this huge rise of turf activism you know trans exclusionary radical feminists and i got into an argument with a couple of them and they just straight up harassed me they misgendered me they said Anytime I like made a forceful argument against them, even if I was still polite, they would point out as, oh, this is entitled male rage. It's like essentially hate speech, something that is actually against Twitter's rules. I reported those TERFs for misgendering me and for referring to me as, you know, as a hateful male or whatever crap and got a response back saying, oh, well, actually, we reviewed it. And in context, it's totally fine. But at the same time, some TERFs on Twitter have been putting in their Twitter bios that they want people to refer to them with they and their or with neo pronouns like Z and Zer. And then any time a pro-trans feminist interacts with them, if, if they don't use those pronouns that they have listed in their bio, then they and their you know hundreds of sock puppet accounts all report that person all at once and get them suspended or banned from Twitter. And so you have this sort of situation where hate groups are actually using these platforms and using their anti-hate speech tools to silence people who fight back against hate speech. These platforms don't give a shit about any of it. And they won't give a shit until it's called out in mainstream media. Until something appears in mainstream media, it doesn't really happen. You know, it's that sort of once something shows up in a publication of record, that's when it becomes official reality as opposed to, you know, that inconvenient actual reality. 
Right. I mean, I think it's an indication more now than perhaps ever before that we need to begin building our own infrastructure, our own networks, our own ability to interact with each other and communicate with each other over vast geographic distances. Because anything short of that, as we continue to use these corporate media forms and as we continue to sort of acquiesce to our own surveillance, we're going to continue to see this kind of vitriolic bullshit. Um, And I think it's now more than ever that we need to begin the serious application of building digital and physical infrastructure for our movements. Absolutely, because you can see how the way the liberal media covers this like enables this perceived persecution that a lot of right wing people are pretty sure that they're experiencing right now. Like I, I think that there was like some study recently the majority of American Christians believe that they are being religiously persecuted right now. And a lot of people have pointed out that this is exactly how fascist ideology kicks off by capitalizing on this perceived victimhood. And so by allowing a video to get super popular and then taking it down, it completely supports that exact same narrative and allows people like this to get even more followers and stuff because now they're a firebrand, now they're a martyr, you know, people want to take their their videos down, but they're just too popular, you know. It completely plays into the fascist hands, and it's it's a perfect example of how liberalism enables fascism. At the same time, though, kicking someone off a platform can have a real effect on that person's ability to spread hate speech. Laura Loomer and Jacob Wall have been kicked off of Twitter, and it's been a huge blow to their careers. If you're not familiar with them, I recommend checking out um, a recent episode of Behind the Bastards. That's Robert Evans' podcast we had him on on our last episode you know he does a very good overview of jacob wall and laura loomer and the sort of crazy right-wing grifting that they've done but those individuals were recently banned from twitter for committing actual crimes and broadcasting them on twitter and it's been a huge blow to them because these sorts of media firebrand personalities thrive on attention and if someone hasn't hit the big time well enough to get onto fox news or wherever Twitter and Facebook and YouTube are the places where these people build social capital, where they get attention, where they get the ability to create narratives and to influence the conversation. Removing those people has done actual damage to the right's ability to create propaganda. So it's a sort of a balancing act that, yeah, removing these people and hurting these movements is a good thing, but it also gives them ammunition to claim that they're victims. And when they get that, they sort of gain power in a different way from doing that. They gain credibility for their victim narrative, which is sort of the driving force behind their ideology. Right. And that's exactly why the solution in the first place needs to be to find the information before it gets popular and get rid of it. Those people have to be deplatformed before they can put their poison in people's heads. But we get that problem then where we're using those platforms as well and giving those platforms the tools and the moral authority to remove fascists can also backfire and allow them to remove leftists or other people who, you know, have political disagreements or who have interests that are opposed to the interests of the platform owners. So Mm. you have Chapo Trap House, the subreddit on Reddit, is possibly being banned for promoting violence, which... I don't think is particularly fair, but it could be justified. But they're talking about banning Chapo Trap House while allowing subreddits like the Donald or various neo-Nazi subreddits that spring up from time to time. And it's because this particular subreddit is spreading socialist ideals very successfully and is creating a base of users who are ideologically opposed to Reddit's interests. So Reddit is interested in creating a narrative to justify shutting down this subreddit where people are radicalized into leftist politics. And they're doing so because they've been given that moral authority to act previously against right-wing subreddits and against places like, you know, r slash jailbait or cringe anarchy or or fat people hate or other unseemly places online. So... Basically, I'm agreeing with you, Parison, that we really need to develop our own platforms and our own, you know, sort of spaces that are not under this sort of corporate control, where we can ban fascists from our platforms while allowing our own ideas to get room to breathe. And that's why I think that things like Means TV is extremely important, although I think that I have some concerns about 
uh, what they're trying to do. But I think that the ultimate goal of it, of having a left-wing platform for leftist video content, is an extremely important thing that the left needs to promote. Yes, I absolutely agree. Before we move on, I just wanted to take a moment to plug my new Patreon account at www.patreon.com slash Eklar. That's F-A-Y-E-E-C-K-L-A-R. Contributing to my Patreon will help me out a lot with transition-related medical costs, buying ammo for range days, and the inevitable rent increases of my gentrifying neighborhood. If you enjoy the SRA podcast, or if you want to help support my organizing work, I'd greatly appreciate the help. Love and solidarity, comrades. Y'all want to talk about some guns? Uh, yeah, I'm always down to talk about guns. Always. <laughs> Let's do it. This is the SRA podcast, after all. Yeah, this is, this is typically how it goes. We get on a topic and just kind of like rant about how fucked it is and then <laughs> and then we end, end I mean, up talking about how to shoot things afterwards <laughs> i feel like that's the perfect like program for a podcast is like it's, let's get mad and then let's talk about things that make us less mad <laughs> it's so cathartic <laughs> so what's something that y'all want to know about guns I, I guess i'm sort of the subject matter expert is there anything that y'all are curious about yeah, are you are you a pretty experienced uh, shooter and all that? Me, as in uh, they or as in myself? Uh, you. Oh yeah. no, yeah, I'm I'm not. No, listen, I I used to go hunting when I was a, a wee tot, and only joined the SRA about a year and a half ago. And Probably been... less. We haven't even really been around for a year and a half. Okay, like a year ago, then we'll say, <laughs> um, and. Joined the SRA about a year ago and have been doing range days and networking with folks and trying to build up the education. I think that obviously it's really important for the left to be armed, but I am not especially knowledgeable, nor am I good at shooting per se. Although I will say I went to a range day the other day and one of our comrades had a a red dot sight and it was cheap. It was like not even... Like, there was no challenge. It was just, oh, uh, I put the red dot sight, I pull the trigger, and it hits exactly where I want it to go. Which That's is so cool. <laughs> wild. But yeah, I also found out recently that I have to shoot lefty, um, which is not my dominant hand. I have to shoot lefty because my right eye has keratoconus, um, which is like a obscure eye disease that's eventually going to make me go blind in my right eye, which is fun. I can't like look through the scope with my right eye and so I found out that now I have to shoot with my left. It's been so long since I've actually shot that I've had to go back and like sort of reteach myself how to shoot lefty, but it's not hard, it's just a switch. Oh, okay. Dang, that's that's intense. Wow. Good thing you tried out the red dot sight then. That'll that'll make it a bit easier. Yeah, it's super super wild. Um it was fun as fuck. So Highly recommend if you have access to one, do it because it's super cool. It's like having like aim assist. It's it's ridiculous. You know, back when I used to play uh, Call of Duty, the red dot sight was my favorite. So you know, this all makes sense to me. <laughs> 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 Call of Duty skill translates into because uh, real obviously, life skill. obviously, shooting a gun in Call of Duty is the exact same as shooting a gun in real life. We all it know is, that. It is one to one. It just it's is. A, it's a training simulator. <laughs> but uh, yeah, red dots are red dots are great. Um, sort of what's been going on in the competitive shooter, military police operator sort of space in the past several years is that they're actually putting red dots on pistols now. They ha- finally have red dots that are small enough and durable enough that you can mount them to a pistol slide. And essentially you keep the pistol iron sights but also put a red dot that is co-sighted so that both the iron sights and the red dot both point at the same point of impact when you shoot. And doing that, essentially, the most accurate way to shoot a pistol, it's the easiest way to aim. It's a very slick setup, and I kind of want to do it. I'm planning to pick up a CZ-75 pistol here soon, and I sort of want to get that setup on it because it, you know, as awful as 
military and police are, they are good at guns and they've sort of figured out the best sighting arrangement for a pistol. Like pistol mounted red dots are really slick and you know, anyone out there who's looking for a sort of high-end tactical setup on their pistol, I highly recommend it. You can reach out in the firearms channel in the SRA Slack if you want more info on that. But uh, lately I've been dealing with a much, much, much older pistol. I recently bought a CZ-50, a Czech pistol manufactured in 1952. It's a really cool gun. It's a little small steel frame, 32 caliber, you know, sort of similar to the Walther PPK, you know, the James Bond pistol. It's basically a knockoff of that design. So I recently just bought that and I tore it down because I was having issues with the trigger and I've discovered that the trigger spring is broken and the trigger springs are unobtainium. You can't buy them anymore. (laughs) Unobtainium. Unobtainium. God, that was the worst name. (laughs) (laughs) Dude, I... Hard to getium. Totally, totally, like tangential now but i have to bring it up i can't believe that they're making another five avatar films like are you kidding me five you, they're what? making five of them as if the first one wasn't awful enough they're making another five of them which oh is like God. that's what just just to be clear that is what unobtainium is from right that is an avatar reference oh just, yeah 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 okay, no no it, it was true. around before that oh was it really the first media reference that i know of was from Oh, you, you're, what was that video where, was it Bruce Willis went into space with a bunch of drillers to, like, drill into an asteroid? Oh, or... Armageddon? No, sorry, it wasn't Armageddon. It was the opposite of that one. It was the one where they where they had Event a... Event Horizon? A... No, no, the other one. They, dro- they drove a drill the down into the core. The core. The core, yeah. The, the drill in the core was made out of unobtainium. Nice, very good. But it's but it's an engineering joke. It's apparently it started back in the eighties. But it's like if you have an engineering idea that's too out there for modern materials to come up with, you say, "Oh, we'll just build it out of unobtainium." I, I <laughs> just I just love that they're just beyond they're beyond satire now. Like they'll just unironically say, "Oh yeah, it's a lot of unobtainium down there." <laughs> Uh, it's just like lazy science fiction writing. Like good science fiction really writing is. actually like reflects, you know, science and like builds upon those theories and scientific philosophy. But this that's just like, oh yeah, I can't solve it, so I'm just going to call it unobtainium. Like, come on. <laughs> it is really hard to come up with fake metal names though. You know, it's like it's it's just basically impossible. You know, you'd have to find like a a person who is like paid to write words, you know, in order to like do it right. And that's just, <laughs> I mean, you're just asking for trouble if you do that. Hell yeah. Well, what else do you guys want to talk about then? I don't really have any questions about guns. Um, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think of a good one for you, Faye. Oh, for sure. Or like Austin, if you had any. Yeah, it's hard with me because I, uh, I grew up around guns a lot and haven't spent too much time around them in the last like last 10 years or so and so like most of my gun knowledge or gun questions are about guns from you know over 10 years ago so they're just like way less relevant now i'm like oh yeah keltec's a good company people are like who who fucking cares like what <laughs> what, what is keltec doing right now people hate keltec right now because they complain that their guns are cheaply made i think they're all right i mean it's not a high-end product but they're they're fine the Caltech Sub 2000 carbine is still a great pistol caliber carbine if you wanted something like that. It'll get the job done. I guess I'm kind of curious if, like, let's say, not that this applies to me, like, dead on or anything like that, but let's say you're, like, a little bit of a Kami cosplayer and you might want to buy, like, a Mosin Nagan or an SKS or something like that, you know, like an older one. Is is that worth doing at all? Like, is it worth it to, like, go and buy, like a like, a Mosin? So if you really want a gun, you should buy that gun if that's something that you really want. But as far as like, if you wanted a gun that might have a practical use or was a good buy for the money, it's not really anymore. Like there was an argument for the Mosin Nagant back when you could get one for $100. Uh-huh. These days, they're like $350, $400, $500 for one in decent shape. And it's like... Don't spend four hundred dollars on a Mosin Nagant. Yeah, <laughs> it's fair. not. It's not worth four hundred dollars. It wasn't worth four hundred dollars when it was made. 
Um, <laughs> but rifles like the SKS or like uh, the AK-47, those can still be a good time. Again, they're not as cheap as they used to be. There was a period like a decade ago when AK-47s were cheaper than AR-15s, and so they were a really good option if you were on a budget. These days, getting an AK that is safe and durable to fire is a lot more difficult. It's a lot more expensive. There's a lot of companies now that are buying incomplete guns, like parts kits, or like a lot of the guns that are made in the US these days, they will use cast parts where they have a mold and they fill it with metal and to get the complex shapes, whereas the originals were made from taking a solid block of steel and then milling it down to shape. The cast parts are a lot weaker, so things like the barrel trunnion or the, uh, the gas block, those parts are a lot more fragile on American guns and they tend to break and or get cracks in them. So a lot of the cheap AKs on the market these days with American-made parts, they're not really worth it because they're going to break after a few thousand rounds. So in order to get a good AK, you have to look at higher-end ones, look for ones that are using original parts from Romania or Poland or wherever they're importing them from at the moment. The 50-year-old parts from a warehouse in Eastern Europe are going to be more reliable than the stuff coming out of a modern American factory, which is kind of ironic when we talk about extolling the virtues of capitalism. (laughs) American-made. It's always better because the costs are as low as possible. and, (laughs) And we pay our workers garbage so you know it's good. (laughs) <laughs> yeah SKS's are still a good time though I'll always recommend the SKS I, I stand for a clip loading rifle <laughs> yeah that makes sense but um, I guess that's that's one other thing talking about what you brought up Parison is the way that the entire gun industry is sort of shit <laughs> um, but the way you don't you know, say you know obviously the way that they treat their employees is crap like machinists tend to be extremely underpaid factory workers and that obviously almost none of the firearms industry is unionized in any meaningful way i'm not aware of any uh, unionized firearms manufacturers actually i may be mistaken there may be some but i'm not aware of any and obviously a lot of these companies are run by extremely reactionary people palmetto state armory is a supplier that sells reasonable quality ar-15 parts for extremely affordable prices and When it comes to, like, recommending for working class people to be armed, being able to put together a functioning AR-15 for $350 is amazing, and I want to be able to endorse that. But at the same time, Palmetto State Armory almost manufactured an AR-15 lower with a Kekistan flag on it. They currently manufacture a lower that has build the wall on it. It's just awful reactionary shit. And so if you buy from them, your money is going to awful people. It's sort of that deal where... That's the best deal for a working class person to get an AR, but you're supporting people who are fundamentally opposed to us. And, you know, it's sort of easy to be able to glibly say there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. But in the long run, I do think that we need to look at forming gun co-ops and left wing gun manufacturers and building up a space in this industry that isn't run by fucking monsters. Yeah, I I definitely agree. I, I was going to bring that up because it's like, Sometimes finding a company that isn't monstrous is, is extremely difficult, you know, obviously because ask. no ethical consumption. It, yeah, it's a big ask. So, like, I, I think we should all be kind of on the lookout for gun companies that are unionized, that, that aren't monsters and stuff like that. Because, you know, we can empower the right people, certainly when we have no choices. That's a big problem and stuff, but if we can find a better option or create our own better option, that would obviously be good. Hell yeah. So if you know any ethical or semi-ethical, are the, maybe ethical is the wrong word. Maybe less shitty would be the, the proper less term. Less <laughs> shitty. If you know any less shitty gun manufacturers, let us know. And as far as like starting a gun company that's run by left-wingers or that is a worker co-op or unionized or whatever... If someone out there is thinking about starting a business like that, the SRA would love to support you. We can't afford to like give someone a loan. We're not that big or well-funded, but we can certainly give publicity and certainly drive business to a worker co-op gun store or a co-op you know, worker-run uh, gun range or something like that. If that's something that you're interested in doing, 
please get in contact with us and we'll give you all the support we can. We can like help you build your pitch to get a loan or whatever to try and get that off the ground because that's really the next step. You know, the SRA is just sort of, we build it as the left-wing alternative to the NRA. We build it as a left-wing gun club. We build it as like a political and social organizing space to promote our ideals and serve our communities. But if we want to actually develop a foothold in the firearms industry, we need actual businesses in that space. We need gun manufacturers. We need gun stores. We need ranges that share our values because right now there's basically none and that needs to change that's a that's a good point (laughs) (laughs) yeah sometimes Faye says some like really rad stuff says some dope shit she covers she covers it so fucking thoroughly that i'm just like it's like what uh, what do i even how do i even follow that up (laughs) also yes (laughs) All right, Parison. Well, thank you very much for coming on. It was rad speaking with you today. Yeah, likewise. You want to go ahead and plug your podcast and your Patreon real quick? Oh, yeah, sure. If you don't know, I am the co-host of a shitty podcast called Coffee with Comrades. My <laughs> co-host Mel and I uh, run a podcast that is basically just whatever the hell we want to talk about and it's a good time you can check it out uh you can find us on twitter twitter.com forward slash coffee w comrades or you know listen to us on any podcasting platform of your choice we're on spotify the google play store itunes etc just search coffee with comrades and if you like what you hear you can support us on patreon at patreon.com forward slash coffee with comrades hell yeah I support you, and I recommend anyone else in our audience who enjoys your content to do so as well. So, again, thanks for coming on. It's great speaking with you. So, have a good one, comrade. Solidarity. Likewise. Solidarity, y'all. Solidarity. Solidarity.